with a yeah, I'm going to let you play with it afterwards. You, uh, <laughs> I'm going to try to keep the talks short so there's plenty of time for it to come and play with the machine. Uh, so bef that is uh, the hero of, of the story I'm going to tell. It's a picture of, of Marian uh, Ryuski, who's a Polish mathematician, and I'll be telling you about him. Um, the other picture just so yeah right you always have to ro rotate it again it won't save it that's the enigma machine in use during world war ii notice it took three people we'll talk about that a little bit but um before i start let let, let me you know give the the standard disclaimer um my my hidden agenda here is is is, is um several one of which is that I am um, the director of the Institute for Defense Analyses at Princeton, also known as the Center for Communications Research at Princeton. We're a mathematics think tank. We work for the US government. Uh, we do classified work, but this is not classified, so I get to tell you about it. This is IDA's Enigma machine, so, you know. We, and But I wanted to make two points, one of which is, uh, We'll get to that too. It's it's a while, but I'm not totally sure. Um, uh, I wanted to make two points. Uh, one of which is is a minor one that that the this world I'm working in is a fun place to do mathematics, and that's sort of my my plug. Um, but the second is that more generally, the point of the talk is that theorems actually can change history. <laughs> we tend to think of it as not, but it's uh, theorems can change history. All right. So there we are. So what is next on this? There we go. Okay. So um, let's first of all talk about why anybody needs any kind of machine like this. Um, basically, uh, people sometimes want to send messages that they don't want other people to be able to read. Uh, so we, people have been using codes, well, I mean, they're codes dating back from uh, Babylonian times, so for, forever and ever. But in fact, um, the need for uh, codes uh, ballooned quite a bit at, with the invention of the radio, because now anybody with another radio receiver could listen to your conversation, and if you wanted to keep it secret you needed to do something else so um, and the way you you keep it secret is is use a code um, so how do you keep it secret well one sort of obvious thing to do is basically reorder the 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 alphabet you know don't use a for a use something else for a uh, don't use etc cetera, etc cetera. what that is uh, uh, I'll remind those of you who, who know a lot of math, this is for undergraduates. What that is, is is a permutation. Basically, there are 26 factorial ways you can reorder the, the, the alphabet. As it turns out, the, the, for the purposes of Enigma, the German alphabet also had 26 letters. Uh, skipped umlauts and all of that. Um, and, and 26 factorial is... Uh, that number up there, it's approximately 4 times 10 to the 26th, and it is a huge number. And so it seems like if you picked a random permutation, whatever that means, and applied it to your message, uh, you would get something that wasn't readable. That's what I did here. I, I took the Gettysburg Address, or at least the beginning of it, and, and I applied the, the permutation up there. Now, I need to talk about why that's a permutation. That's a permutation in, in um, cycle decomposition mode. So the AD in parentheses means that A turns into D and D turns into A. And the BCF means B turns into C, C turns into F, and F turns into B again, etc. And so it's a very, among other things, it's a very concise way to write down a permutation. And I apply that a permutation to, to uh, that the, the Gettysburg Address, and I get the, the stuff on the bottom. Uh, so, um, and that seems secure, but it's actually extremely insecure. 
The reason is, is that uh, English, or any language, and German included, are very non-random. Okay? For example, E's occur a great deal of time. And if you, you don't have to, the message doesn't happen to be very long, and, and, and except in very unusual circumstances, the most common letter in your, your thing is going to be E. So already now, you've, gotten, you've cut the size down by a factor of 26. A's are very common. That's what I, 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 what I have there is the count. There are an N11s, N is a common letter. Maybe you might have guessed N first and then A, but you reverse it. And then there, there, there are double letters. TH is very common, and, and you know, other combinations with T are not. And so in fact, um, it's very easy to break this code. Well, TH being common is English specific. Huh? TH being common is specific. specific, but there are similar things in German. Yes. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> another question entirely. Uh, that was an oral code, so it doesn't arise. Um, OK, so instead of um, that, what you need to do is you have to change the text in some way at every, differently in every position of the text. OK? Uh, and, and if you do that in an absolutely random, unpredictable way, then you have uh, what's called a one-time pad. Um, and it's, a very, it's, you know, it's very hard to carry such a thing around, but it actually uh, uh, was used. The story I know is that the uh, Soviet agents in the US, starting in World War II and afterwards, used uh, one-time pads. And if, they, if that's all that had happened, it would have been basically unbreakable. Uh, Unfortunately, we didn't catch them very quickly. And after a while, your one-time pad runs out of permutations. And there's only, I mean, you can't go back, so the only thing you can do is start reusing it, which is what they did. So they started reusing it. It got reused a fair amount. And when we realized that it was being reused, um, they, a project was started. It's called the Venona Project. It, it was. The culmination was in the early 90s. It, it, became, it was a secret project, but it, it was announced, where some people, entirely by hand, no computers, sat down and basically broke those, uh, the codes for Soviet agents starting from a long time before. Uh, and if you would think that in 1990, nobody cared about what was going on in 1945 with Soviet agents, then you never heard of Alger Hiss. Because people still cared, and they cared a lot. So it was a, but that's not practical if you're running a huge military machine. So the Enigma machine that I have down on the on the um, table here is going to do the same, or it's going to purport to do the same thing uh, mechanically. And and it was considered unbreakable because it was basically the first electromechanical coding machine. Before that, it was all done by hand. Um, and uh, what happens is that every time you push a, um, a letter, a light lights up. Okay, So I pushed P, and a light uh, lit up. But if I push P again, now it's a B. The permutation changes for every position in, in, the, um, in the message. I push, and then I get an N, then I got a K, then I got an H. And it looks pretty, you know, since it's changing every time, it looks uh, pretty hard. Um, but let's uh, talk about the innards. Let me actually open it up. Some of you can see, some will have to come up later. Um, there are basically uh, um, three, in this machine, three rotors. And this thing here is called a reflecting disk. There is also a plug board up here, OK? And then, a, and then the, the lights. So people always ask me, is this um, original? This box and basic machinery is from World War II, but batteries don't last forever. <laughs> so um, if you open this, this old looking battery ca container, you'll see 4D batteries. <laughs> from EverReady, I think. Anyway, um, so it's not totally from World War II, but anyway. Uh, so what's going on is you have, uh, first of all, the reflecting disk. It is also a permutation. Um, 
I only basically it has a bunch of contacts on on this side of it, and behind each of those two contacts are wires, thirteen wires connecting in pairs. Okay, I couldn't draw all thirteen wires, but that's the idea there. Every everything on the, every contact on the outside, which corresponds to a lever, is connected to another letter, and so what that is is a permutation that takes when the when the current comes through one contact, it goes out through the other contact. You're permuting the 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 letters. Now, if it went the other way, if it came through the second con, it would go. Th you know, electricity goes both ways. So what this is is a permutation where all of those cycles I wrote down are uh, length two E F. Etc. Thirteen, a product of thirteen two, two cycles. So first of all, well, let let me actually uh, continue. Now the rotors. I'll go to the next uh, thing. The rotors are not are permutations, and they're basically arbitrary permutations. They have contacts on one side and contacts on the other side, and a wire, a set of wires in between them. So they're a fixed permutation. But they're not particularly of this form. And there are three of them. And what happens when you push a, a key is that the outer rotor rotates, which changes the permutation. If you push the key 26 times, the inner thing will rotate once. And then 26 squared is what you have to do before you could get the, the, the last one to change. But the current goes through. This way into the reflecting rotor and out that way, which is a um, very mechanical, concrete way to talk about conjugation in a group. What you have, you're going in, uh, let's say, going out in by sigma inverse, doing all of this and going out by sigma. Okay. Now the plug board is uh, another permutation. It, it's connecting letters to letters, and I'm not going to undo it because it's very hard to do it back. Um, but, it, but it just changes sigma. And the fact that the plug board is very hard to do back is also important because they didn't change the plug board very often. Okay, that is what was called a long term. We call a long term crypto variable, and so they would leave the plug board alone for months. All right, now some of you may have had abstract algebra, I'll, others not. Nonetheless, there's a, not a hard theorem, but there's a theorem that you do early on in permutations, which says that this is another product of 13 uh, uh, two cycles. OK? Uh, now, the, of course, the entries have changed. That's what sigma does for you. But it's another product of thir 13 two cycles. So what does that do? Well, that means that all of the permutations, every time I, 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 I do this, all of the permutations are of a fairly special type. They are products of 13 two cycles. They are of order two. You do it twice, uh, uh, and you get back to where you started. From. A, you do it twice, and A goes to A, B goes to B, et cetera. That, by the way, was considered a, a, um, a feature, not a bug. Because what that means is, is that the process of encryption and decryption are the same. That is one huge convenience. Okay. But uh, now you've re reduced quite a bit the space of permutations that you're applying at every point of the message. Now it's only uh, about 8 times 10 to the 12. Well, quite a bit smaller. That's the number of products of disjoint two cycles. And then there is a. Um, uh, there's another thing, and this is actually quite important. It's not only that it has order two, but a letter is never sent to itself. Okay, it's it. There's no way to so every so um, a never goes to a, no matter what how many times you try. All right. So <laughs> what I did was I I, I uh, took I set the I put I made a, a note to myself what the plug board was set. The rotor settings, the rotors are numbered on this machine. I set the rotors, and then I, uh, I, I uh, encrypted the uh, um, Gettysburg Address again. But I did it in, in, in um, five-letter groups. That's, 
that standard. I'm told it's, uh, it was a, a radio standard from the 1920s in a previous talk somebody told me. And, and that's how it comes out when you decrypt it. That's why I was so careful. I wanted to encrypt it and decrypt it and come back with the Gettysburg Address. It took me three tries. <laughs> this is hard work. Okay, and you got to do it exactly right. And if you if you if you lose your place, I found the five letter grouping essential. I thought it was just you lose your place immediately if you didn't have a sort of five letter group to the to the encryption because it makes no sense. It, you don't know what you're saying. Anyway, I you'll see that you have to think about it a little. You, you have to put in the the word breaks that, that they're not put in for you. There's no space on that machine. Nonetheless, you could figure out that it's the Gettysburg Address. Uh, okay. The other thing you will notice is that um, my fingers hurt. Well, you won't notice that, but my fingers hurt. This was 1940s technology. It had a battery, but it, that battery had to last a long time. And so nothing was electrified except the light up the lamp when you hit, hit the button. That means this is actually real work. My fingers, you know, my, I got sore fingers from doing this. And also, remember that picture I showed you in the beginning where there were three people? It took three people to do this because it, nothing was printed. One guy was pushing the buttons. Another guy was reading off um, what letters had lit up because the guy pushing the buttons couldn't be relied on to remember it correctly. That's the mistake I made. I was only one person. And, and the third guy was on the radio. This is a radio code. And, and the, the third guy was, was listening to statements over the radio. And that's why there were, there, were, there were those three people. And that's why it took three people. But it saved the battery. OK. No letter. Yeah. So did they do this sort of live? Or did the, did the guy on the radio write it down and then they decrypted it? No, you saw it live. Okay. You saw it live. They, did, you know, they had more people than they had. Uh, as far as I, I know. I mean, I wasn't there, actually. I, I know I have white hair and all, but I wasn't there. Um, so no letter is encrypted by itself. Uh, uh, look at that encryption. I set the rotors, and I encrypted something. And look at, at, at that, uh, at that uh, bunch of five-letter groups. I won't tell you what the number underneath is in, in, for a moment. Anybody notice anything? There are three Ws in a row. That can happen. Anybody? I, I always say, I, if anybody notices what's unusual about that message, I'd be forced to hire them. And luckily, I'm not. Uh, the letter L does not appear. The letter L does not appear. Exactly. This happened. in, in There was a, an Italian version of this machine. And a code clerk got a page-long message without the letter L. And the code clerk was smart enough to realize that there's only, I mean, the probability of no L's in that short message is what that number is down there. So the code clerk was smart enough to realize the only way that you could get a page full of, of in Enigma encryption with no L's is if the whole message originally were L's. Somebody, they thought they, they, thought they were going to drive the allies crazy. They sent all L's as a message. Come on, try to decrypt that. In fact, they did that day very easily. <laughs> They, and therefore, they knew the, the rotor settings for the day. I mean, they broke it for that day. Here's a more, a more subtle point about why the, the fact that no letter goes to itself is, is a flaw. It means, remember what I told you, is, is, is that since no letter goes to itself, it doesn't, it's not quite flat. The fact that there were a lot of E's means that there were fewer E's, because the, they never go to themselves, there are fewer E's in the encryption. And so if you have a long enough message, it means you can look at the statistics of what letters appear and say, oh, that must be Enigma. Or that, at least that, you know. And, and yeah. So the positions of the rotors encode sigma? The positions of the rotors and the plug boards encode sigma. Yes. OK. All right. So um, how, how um, so the, the the, the, I said breaking Enigma for the first time. What I want to tell you is how the Poles broke Enigma, because I also saw the movie, and they somehow didn't get mentioned. Um, so the picture I showed you is that fellow, Marin Ryuski. He was a young uh, mathematician. He, he'd got a master's degree in Poland. He went to 
Heidelberg to study further, but he wanted to get a job, so he was uh, studying actuarial stuff. But they, they, they had noticed he had worked a little bit for the Polish government at Codes. They knew that he was good at it, so they brought him back. And it, there was basically a team of three people. And if I were really good at this, I'd remember the other two names. But he was the head of the team. And they started try, t looking at Enigma ma messages and st trying to break them. What I want to tell you about is a little bit about the math. What year was that? Oh, 35? OK. Um, the problem with any system like this is that both sides have to have the same rotor settings and plug board settings in order for them to for it to work encrypt and decrypt okay now the plug board wasn't so hard because as i said it didn't change very much but the daily the rotor settings you know were a problem you you know so what the um Germans did. Also, it's a bad idea to send too long a message with the same crypto variable, the same rotor setting. You had a question. No, I'm about to tell you. There, there was a hard message, which basically a long list before you went out into the field of the daily rotor settings for a long time. But they wanted to limit the amount of messages they use those settings for. So what they would do is they would use the daily rotor settings to encrypt the per message settings. Okay? And then they would encrypt the per message settings and then they would the the op, the receiver would get the per message setting, change the setting so he could actually decrypt the message and he's off and running. Now, problem. You saw that picture. It's over radio. It's over a, a, a 1940s radio, a lot of static, a lot of noise. If you don't get the three rotor settings right, um, you can't read the message at all. Not close. Not even approximately anything. So they sent it twice. Okay? They would send the rotor settings, and then they would send it again. That would be, the be at the beginning of every message, was the message, the rotor settings for that message sent twice. And uh, But what that means is that you're giving away some information. And this is what the polls realized. You, are, you don't know what the permutation on the, um, the first place is. But um, you know that, you know what, and remember these have order two, so it doesn't matter how you, the, the thing and its inverse are the same. You know the product of the permutation that was applied in place one and place four. Because basically if, the rotor settings were one, uh, what did I put down there? 1623. Then uh, you know this is one to something, and this one to something. So you look at a, a message, and you know that that character goes to that character, and, and the opposite. OK? So you're being told the product of the first and the fourth place, the second and the fifth place, and the third and the sixth place. OK? Uh, under the daily rotor setting, that, that, that those, the product of those permutations. And uh, there are a lot of messages. It doesn't take a lot of message before every letter, possible letter appears here and there. And so you actually, with relatively few messages, have learned the whole permutations product for, for that day, here and here, there and there. So, so the question is, is if you have this product of 13 two cycles, with another different product of 13 two cycles, what do you get? And there's a theorem that, that uh, Ryuski proved, the theorem up there. Uh, suppose I had two permutations, products of 13 two cycles, and I multiply them together, and no, so no, no fixed points. Then the product itself has a cycle decomposition, and the cycle decomposition is special. Basically, the, the cycle decompositions, the cycles all come in pairs. Okay? So you'll have a, if you have a cycle of length 5, you have another cycle of length 5. And in fact, the way it works, it's even better than that. Let's say, this is A, whoa, A, B, C, D, E, 
and the other one was F, G, H, I, J. A time by one of those is one of the two cycles in, in one of the in in the thing. So the, the proof of the theorem says that not only do you know that it has special form, but if you pair up the cycles correctly, you are very close to actually knowing the permutation. Uh, so that makes what should be you know clear is some days were better than others. They, they had a they had a semi automatic you know sort of semi machine way of you look at the cycle decomposition of of the um, uh, you, you look at the cycle key decomposition and and you get um, sometimes it's easy because all the cycles are come in pairs and and there are no no uh, no cycles come in four pick times only two so you know how to pair them up automatically and then you get fairly little bit of work you get the permutation sometimes there are, there are a lot of cycles of all the same length and there are a lot more possibilities but um, nonetheless you sit down and you work it out there's there's a you do some algebra one of the things um, they needed help with was the plug board but uh, the French got them the plug board settings and as I said that was a um, long-term cryptic variable so basically they could take it out of the equation as a known and and get well what they were aiming at and what they got from all of this work was the first rotor this outer rotor over here okay um, because most of the time not always and they could figure out when that happened most of the time and those when you sent those six uh, cycle settings the the second rotor didn't move so you were getting the outer rotor okay so uh, that's good but um, part of the way that the Germans thought they were making it more secure, and they were in some sense, was that they not only, they, these rotors are removable. So there was another uh, six possibilities of the orders that the rotors were in. But of course, as you move the rotors around, and they're breaking it, that got... No, how, I literally put these rotors come out, and you can change them around and put them back in, and mechanically lift out and come back in. Yeah, you get the wiring pattern in the rotor. And after a while, you get the wiring pattern in uh, all three rotors. And now, of course, you have, to, you have to worry about which order they're in, but you know, a six is actually not that big a number. And you've now got uh, three of them, and when they added new rotors, which they did every once in a while, you, didn't, you could figure out what that one is, and, and you're all done. OK. So they were uh, reading a lot of the messages, not necessarily quickly, because some days were harder to break than others and all that kind of stuff. But um, they were. Uh, after a while, the, the Germans stopped sending the rotor settings at the beginning, but they still they found other ways to break in, and they were still reading the messages. Germany invades 1939. Germany invades Poland. Um, and uh, the, the, uh, this team uh, basically runs. They run, they cross the Romanian border. At the, uh, at the border, the Romanians, who were actually allied with the Germans, wanted to send them all into a camp, but they got away and they went down to Bucharest. The back story here is, is, is that they had told some of what they knew about the Enigma machine to the French and the British. So they, they, you know, so they go to the uh, uh, British Embassy in Bucharest, and they say, um, "We're fleeing from the Germans, and you're really going to want to help us get to London." Uh, and the British say, "Well, they were busy. It was it was total chaos, all this kind of stuff." And and they uh, they say, "Come back tomorrow." <laughs> and and they didn't want to come back tomorrow because they could have been arrested at any moment. They're, they're, they were, you know fugitives on the street so they went to the French embassy and they said yeah yeah come in come in uh, there was a there was a lieutenant Colonel Bernard who had actually was looking for them when they turned themselves in so it was all and they were um, they went over to uh, Paris and they kept doing their stuff um, yeah you know it's <laughs> not everybody has good luck um, they go to Paris and they're doing their stuff and the Germans invade France and and uh, the
The French last a little longer than, than the Poles, but they, they flee to the south, and they're down in uh, uh, the Marseille area, uh, breaking the, the German messages. This is the part I'd like to understand better, not the mathematics, but the politics. Uh, Vichy, they're working for the Vichy government, um, they are, which, who are supposedly neutral, but are in fact probably very friendly to the Germans, but they're breaking the messages and, and giving the information to the Allies. I guess it was a confused time, but I really do not understand how that happened. Anyway, uh, that was only a, a, a temporary refuge. One of the three cryptographers was killed in a, 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 on a boat crossing the Mediterranean, but eventually when, when we invaded North Africa, the, the Germans decided that Vichy was a luxury they couldn't afford anymore, and they invaded and, and took over all of France. And the, um, the Poles made their way to uh, England the old-fashioned way, you know, hiking over the Pyrenees, getting to Lisbon, trying to get on a boat. Finally, in about 43, uh, they made it, the two of them made it to London, where they were said, uh, basically, they worked for the free, free uh, Polish government, but they had no, they were not asked or allowed to work on Enigma ever again. Uh, one of them uh, stayed, never went back to Poland, but Ryuski went back to Poland at the end of the war. Um, he didn't have a degree, and, and it wasn't clear. I mean, he just had a sort of a quiet life until almost just before he died, he was sort of rediscovered. There was a Polish special about him. He got, uh, there, there are now monuments to the three of them in Poland, but for a long time, he was just forgotten. And, and um, uh, when I was a... a you know, growing up, the story that the Allies had broken Enigma had been kept secret from the war until the early 60s, if I remember correctly. A book came out, and uh, the book never mentioned the Poles. Later on, um, uh, they, they sometimes say the Poles gave them a copy of the machine, which is not really fair, because what they gave them was not just the machine, but the rotors which is, you know, sort of the secret there. But uh, anyway, um, okay, so uh, what, they, some of it they figured out on their own, but some of it, I, if I remember correctly, there was a, a German defector who, who sold them information about the machine in, in the early 30s already. It, it was a, um, modification of a commercial coding machine that, uh, that had been sold in the 20s. The Germans took it and made it more secure, um, added the plugboard, if I remember correctly, for example. But of course, the plugboard was never the hard part. In the first place, how did they know that these are two-sided that, that sh well, yeah, you're exactly right. The structure of the permutations, when they, fa when they found out that when you cut, when multiplied the first and the fourth, you got something highly non-random. You could actually conclude backwards that it must be thirteen two cycles. But at, at that point, they did not know anything about particulars of hydrogen. No, and I don't know the full answer to your question. They got some information, the old-fashioned spying way, and some they simply figured out from from the the non-randomness of the messages they were looking at. You can, as I said, figure out that there are no fixed points. You can do a lot of things like that. But remember, the original uh, commercial machine involved the basic idea of taking uh, a permutation and, and just changing the conjugation as you rotate the rotor. So that, you know, it's not like that was, they had to think of that from, from uh, zero. Oh, uh, commercial yeah, yeah. I may have had only one rotor. I can't remember what it had, but it, it, the basic idea was in the commercial machine. Uh, so what the Brits did eventually to break Enigma was they had to rely on something else because, the, as I say, the Germans stopped setting the rotor uh, settings. They, they relied on what's called cribbing, where you basically guess what's in the message. And then you get a big machine, they called it a bomb with an E at the end, which checks rotor settings until you hit the rotor setting, which gives you what you expect to be in the message. Well, so how do you guess what's in the message? Well, 
it's an art, not a science, but there are a series of things that help. One of which is, as I read somewhere, German has a lot of long, mil German military messages have Oberlieutenant in them a lot, for example. <laughs> and it's a big long word. If your rotor setting hit and found that word in there, you got the right rotor setting. <laughs> Can I ask, if the Germans stopped sending the rotor settings, how did the, the, the Germans be able to communicate without knowing the rotor settings? Uh, what did I, re I remember that actually, you know, I, did, I forgot to look that up and I've forgotten now. Um, what they did was, th they, instead of sending the rotor settings, they sent in the clear, unencrypted, the changes from the daily rotor setting to get to the message rotor setting. And that made it much, that was the, no way to break it, because it, you really needed the, the actual rotor setting to be set. Uh, right, so uh, cribbing, right. The other thing that, in case you ever want to send a lot of secret messages, is do not send messages encrypted where the other guys actually know what's in the message. For example, weather forecasts to the submarines. Okay, if you already know what the weather is, you can make a good guess about what's in the message, and therefore the cribbing works better. Um, on the other hand, not because they particularly were worried about it, but um, the the German Navy um, added a fourth rotor, making the whole thing much harder. And that's one of the dramatic points in the movie was about how they dealt with the fourth rotor, which increased the number of possibilities a great deal and made it much harder to break. But they, they figured out. OK, so um, I was asked about the history of, of this machine, at the extent I know it. Let me tell you about the history of these machines, uh, as far as I know. Um, the fact that they were broken by the Allies was a deep, dark secret that hardly anybody knew until, as I said, you know, 20 odd years after the war. Um, so since it's such an unbreakable coding machine, it clearly couldn't be uh, kept in the hands of, of the Germans, so they were broken. They were smashed. I mean, you know, the German had big military, and they were smashed in no enormous numbers. Okay, very few of them survived that, but some did. You know, and uh, one of them, this one, made it to Washington, and as far as I can figure out, there was a bunch of them sitting in a storeroom someplace, and they decided to throw them out. You know. And, and somebody, uh, I don't even know who it was, said, oh, no, I'll take it, and brought it up to Princeton, to, to where, where I work. Um, rumor is that some other people um, uh, just took them home, uh, which at the time was just a curiosity. Um, look on eBay to be the cost of one of these things. It's, it's a huge amount of money, and, and, and uh, don't kill me for it, please. Uh, <laughs> On the other hand, I heard, you learn things when you give these talks. Somebody told me that Mick Jagger is a big fan of Enigma machines, and he owns two. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, yeah. Anyway, that's my story. Questions? Yeah. Even when they were sending the rotor settings twice, what did the uh, people do if the two didn't agree? Uh, resend, please, presumably. Um, I, I'm just guessing, but that happens all the time, and, and you know. Weren't they also helped by things like Heil Hitler was in all the messages? <laughs> well, uh, I don't know. I mean, that's for cribbing. It's possible, but I'm not sure. That I don't know. I, I know what I read in the history books, which was, you know, uh, German uh, titles. Any other questions? I, I thought there was, um, when you said hero bidding, I was, I remember reading, uh, Poles uh, managed to dive down and, and get an Enigma machine out of the submarine. See, I heard that, 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 like that. Right, I heard that story they about from the, the British side where they got it from a, not the machine, they already had that, but the, the book of daily rotor settings off a German e boat that was operating in, in, in the channel. And that helped them break into the, the German fourth rotor figure out what was going on there. I mean, once, what happens, of course, is you stop being able to read the messages. You don't necessarily know why. And, and uh, you know, that helped them figure out why.
But there are a lot of stories about, about the Enigma, and I, I don't know. You know, I know the ones that I read and for whatever reason believe. And any other questions? Yeah. Uh, so the Kisa method of coding, does it only work with languages that are based in alphabets? Like, what about languages that are, like, for example, the Japanese? Uh, no, it, yeah, it has to be, t you're basically, you're encoding 26 letter alphabet, and I, it doesn't matter. You know, and this machine would only do 26. You just relabel the keys. But yeah, it wouldn't do um, anything with a large alphabet. Yeah? Uh, let's say what, at the time when their technique was working the best, like what percentage of messages were they able to? You know, that's interesting. I just read that. Uh, Max Hastings wrote a book, uh, which I recommend for you, called The Secret War. Um, where he was talking about, he said that we're getting somewhere between 10, 15% of the messages decoded on only that. You, you do what you can do. Um, you, uh, you know, you, have, you can only do some of them, and it's, you have to work for each one. So you try to pick the ones that, are, that you guess on externals are most important, and, and then you hope you do it in time, because um, there's, there's a lively discussion among World War II historians about how much difference it made and timing was everything of course you know uh, if you got if 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 it came uh, too late it, w it was not useful and from what I read was that the information was quite useful in in the uh, in terms of uh, the Navy and, and sinking ships and then the, the 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 information was quite useful of, uh, in terms of the Battle of Britain and, and the, the Air Force, the Luftwaffe, not so useful for the German army. The, 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 you know, I mean, apparently Enigma messages were used to convince um, uh, the, the British that, that uh, Hitler was going to invade, one of the many ways that, that convinced the British that Hitler was going to invade the Soviet Union, but since Stalin didn't believe him, it didn't do any good. Which, by the way, is, is one of the morals of the story. You can, you can have the, the best intelligence in the world, but the guys who make the decisions have to believe you. And that's, <laughs> that can be a problem. <laughs> yeah. So you said it took three, one to work the machine, one to write it down, and, and the other guy worked the radio. Would he just read it off? Or how did, I mean, what would the Somebody was telling, with, it, it was an oral code. So he was just listening and, and repeating what he heard. Just letter by letter. Letter by letter. I mean, it was total nonsense. You had to be very careful about it. You, there was no pattern that could help your memory. I mean, this is why it was so hard for me to do, really, you know, because there's no pattern. Normally, when we hear something, you know, re read, we, we, we have context and all that kind of self that, that puts some, some error correction in in our brain, but there's none. Yeah. Uh, the difference is you know, modern military communications are coded with RSA, or there are more sophisticated coders. Right? Well, I, I mean... Just to say briefly, of course, what RSA is public key. So they solved the problem, which was clearly the, the, the weak point of this, where, where you didn't have to share keys before you, you had a, a message. You could just, you know, you could, in, in RSA, you have a public and a private key, and you don't have to share keys. Yeah? RSA was, I read somewhere, actually invented by the British one before Yes. Malcolm Williamson. He, he, I, knew, I knew him. He passed away just... Didn't he solve that in like half an hour? No, it, it, an hour. no, no. It's, it's more complicated than that because after all... Um, so what's the assertion? The assertion is, is that RSA was invented or the idea of using factorization to make a code. Uh, uh, and the whole fact that there could be a public key, that, that there could be a... a was invented by uh, somebody who worked for GCHQ. And that is true. I knew him. He passed away about a year ago. What is General something headquarters, General Communications headquarters, something like nobody ever. Said, it's all, yeah, yeah. I mean, they don't quite have road signs. It's in it's in Cheltenham, and they don't quite have road signs that say GCHQ, but they might as well because everybody that's what they call it and that's what they. But anyway, yeah, he, he but he came up with the idea. He saw it was feasible, but um, they didn't particularly want to use it, so. Uh, it was just an idea that, that, that he wrote down in a paper and, and that Rivest and the other two of... Uh, wasn't actually classified by the Oh, yeah, they classified it. And, and it only became unclassified that they had done it first, the last, I don't know, since I was director, so that's in five years ago or so.
that they were willing to say that they'd done it first. Weren't they annoyed that RSA came out? <laughs> 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 that, yeah, I, I guess that's fair. I guess that's fair. I, I, yeah. Any, yeah. So what was the mathematical difference between the uh, Polish and the British approach? So they, I, I understand that they did the, the different method of cribbing. Uh, right. The, uh, computation, but did they have any other computation results? Uh, well, no, not, not different math. They had, they, had, um, they had the bomb. They had a different machine. And they, you know, in order for it, there's, there, the, the machine is one thing, and it, it, except for the fourth rotor, it stayed the same. But the protocols, that, the way they used it, kept changing. So they kept having to figure out which was the new protocols that they were using. The Poles did that twice, but after that, they couldn't break it. And the only way the British could break it was with a sort of basically massive um, mechanical computer, the bomb. Is there any other reason why there is no spin that code? Just simpler. I mean, it's the same reason there's no space, period, or anything else. All, all you want to do is, is send the message, and, and so you, you don't do more than you have to. So by that logic, you would replace Uber Lieutenant by some variation. Some you might, you might, except, you know, you don't. Uh, or you might. It, it's, it's, I mean, the thing about cryptography is that it's this marvelous com com combination of mathematics and human nature. And, and, <laughs> and you have to, you know, I mean, one of the things is, is, they, is, is the Poles had a guess that, that, yeah, yeah, it's over the radio. You probably want to send the rotor settings twice. That's what's going on. That, that was a guess that they could verify. But they had to make the case first off. Yeah. I also heard that uh, when they uh, were choosing the uh, per message codes, they didn't choose a random letter, but uh, three letters at the same time, or neighboring letters on the keyboard. That was a, a matter of human nature again, but it was it was a it was a good guess. The actual the person who set the per message indicator, who was was actually the encoder, the code clerk guy who was who's doing it, probably a private, and. Yeah, they could be quite lazy, and and just you know sometimes set very poor choices. Um, and once again, and and if I remember correctly, uh, Ryuski says in his paper that one of the uh, ways they first got into it is they made the guess that that particular operator had done that, that for that message, you know. Um, but just think about you know all you guys have passwords for your computer accounts and think about how many of them are really weak. <laughs> I mean, it's you know, it's human nature. <laughs> I actually they have, and long before. I, so I used to give this before I became director. I I gave Enigma talks without having a, the machine, which was much harder because this sort of sells itself. But um, I some guy in Germany had written his his master's thesis. And I, I downloaded the, it wasn't an app back then, it was just a program. And, and they, it was an Enigma program, and I used to, because you see, you know, I used it, I was a math professor. I wanted to get my students interested in algebra. <laughs> and so I gave, you get talk to high school students about it, and it was on my, my laptop. You know, currently, you probably might know, what is the, the coding method for the American Army or for the uh, modern army? They still use RSA or? Let me uh, let me refer you back to my statement that we do classified research. Okay. <laughs> of course, any answer contains information, but I think I can live with what the information that that was conveyed. <laughs>